Well, it's a huge privilege for me to join you here on this campus. I thank Dr. Aiken and those with him for the invitation. I do have to correct something Bruce said. I, from my observation, the book The Gagging of God has quite a few advantages. Um, it can put you to sleep. I, <laughs> Far from not reading it when you want to go to bed, I, I recommend it. It serves as a good doorstop. In fact, when the book first came out, I was supposed to speak somewhere in Washington, D.C. Uh, on the subject, and Mark Dever, who was there introducing me, held the book up and he says, Don Carson has written this very fat book called The Gagging of God. I've got one question. Who will gag Don? <laughs> so you see, uh, the book has many different flavors. Now, I want to begin right away by reading our text, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 25 to 37. Luke 10, 25 to 37. Now, I spent many years in England, nine of them. And there, owing to the liturgical tradition of the Anglican Church, very often when people finish reading the Bible publicly, they say, this is the word of the Lord. And the whole congregation says, thanks be to God. Isn't that a nice piece of liturgy? So when I'm finished tonight, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord. And you will say? I'm determined to reintroduce this to Baptist heritage. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So, to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the man who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Now, although I haven't field tested the thesis, I suspect it is true that this is among the best known parables of Jesus. Mind you, most people who are not biblically well-formed don't know anything of the section that I've just read, if they know the parable, they're likely just to know verses 30 to 35, the narrow story itself. And what is usually inferred in the broader culture from this parable is that basically real Christianity isn't about a whole lot of abstract theology and strange things like substitution and Miracles like rising from the dead. It's basically about really being kind to your neighbor, sacrificially, across cultural barriers. 
It's a Samaritan, for goodness sake, a disgusting Samaritan who's the hero. It's a bit like having an Anglican bishop go by and go on the other side of the road, and, and a Baptist parson go by on the other side of the road, and then a local imam goes by, and he's the hero. That's what the gospel is about, don't you see? Well, my dad was a preacher, and he kept teaching me very early on a text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. So it's important not only to know the story, it's important to know the immediate context, and then a slightly larger context, and then the context of Luke before we ask questions about how it fits into the whole Bible. So what I want to do this evening is, first of all, work through the text with you, and then look carefully at some of the broader contexts, and then think through carefully some applications in our lives individually and in the broader culture. That's where we're going. So first of all, the parable. Verses 25 to 37 are structured in two matching dialogues. Look carefully. In both cases, the lawyer asks a question, then Jesus responds by asking his own question, and then the lawyer answers Jesus' question, and only then does Jesus, Jesus answer the lawyer's question. And then the whole pattern repeats. So look, 25. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the lawyer's question. Jesus doesn't answer. Instead, he asks his own question. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And then the lawyer gives the answer to Jesus' question. He quotes Scripture. Two passages. Verse 27. And then verse 28, Jesus then answers the lawyer's question. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will leave. Live. But then the lawyer wants to justify himself. We'll ask what that means in a moment. And so the cycle begins again. And who is my neighbor? That's his question. In reply, Jesus asks his question, but in order to ask his question, he sets it up with a story. And the story is what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. So he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, and after he's told the story to set up his question, his question is, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Then the expert answers Jesus' question, and then Jesus answers the lawyer's question. So, come then to the first dialogue. An expert in the law, we're told. Not simply a lawyer in our terms, because the law in question in that culture was the law of God. So he was simultaneously lawyer and theologian. And generally such people were pretty highly respected in the culture. He stood up to test Jesus. Now in those days, Usually the teacher sat and others sat around him, a student sat around him. But if a student had a question to raise, the student didn't put up his hand, he stood to his feet. It was meant to be a mark of respect to the teacher. But when this lawyer stands up, it's not because he's respecting Jesus. The text rather slyly says he stood up to test Jesus. In other words, he was being two-faced. That happens often enough in the Gospels. There are some who approach Jesus with great courtesy and really do want to hear him. And there are others, like some mentioned, for example, in 2020 in this book. Not this 2020, the 2020 in Luke, where they're just asking questions in order to challenge Jesus. And he asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the question is slightly bizarre. If the, if the question is, what do I do to inherit eternal life, what sort of answer would you expect? Choose the right parents. Isn't that what you normally have to do to inherit something? I mean, it, it is slightly bizarre. Of course, Jew, Jews did sometimes speak of inheriting eternal life, but when they spoke in these terms, what they meant is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The focus wasn't on inheriting, it's, it's what, what I must do. What, what, what will gain me access? But the question is strange enough that Jesus doesn't answer it. He asks his own question. Now, I've got a friend, a former student, called Randy Newman, who wrote a book a few years ago called Questioning Jesus. 
Now, it's not because he advocates questioning Jesus. It's that Jesus himself asks questions. What he does is goes through all of the Gospels and finds all the places where somebody asks Jesus a question, and Jesus doesn't respond with an answer, but responds with his own question. And Randy starts asking the question, I wonder if we should be doing some of that in our evangelism. And he gives lots of scenarios to work it out. Go buy the book. It's worth it. For example, somebody comes to you and says, you don't really believe in hell, do you? What do you say? <clears throat> well, yes, um, to justify hell, I need to explain something about the holiness and transcendence of God. <laughs> well, theologically, you're on the right track, but you've just lost him. <laughs> Randy suggests a slightly different route. You don't mean to say that you think everybody should go to heaven, do you? And then usually the answer comes back, well, I'm, 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 I'm probably Hitler shouldn't go. <laughs> Maybe Stalin, Paul Pot, perhaps. Oh, what are your criteria for who should go and not go? And suddenly you've got a conversation going, don't you see? Sometimes we're so busy giving an answer that we're not engaging with people. And one of the things that Jesus does really shrewdly again and again and again in Holy Scripture is answer a question with a question, not because he's ducking. Oh, there are a lot of us who teach, who do it all the time. I'm an expert at it. <laughs> but that's not why Jesus does it. He does it precisely to draw the man out, get him to commit to something, and then you can actually engage with something rather than merely score points. So the man replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's a very interesting answer, partly because it's the same answer that Jesus gives in another context with a different lawyer. You can find the passage in Mark 12. 28 to 34, and parallels elsewhere. Mark 12, 28 to 34. There a lawyer comes to Jesus and does not say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But asks the question and said, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replies with exactly this answer. The greatest, he says, is love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And he says, I'll throw in the second greatest too, love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes the same two passages, one from Deuteronomy 6 and the other from Leviticus 19. Now it's important before we press on to understand what those two passages are saying. Put yourself in the world of polytheism, the world of paganism. I don't care whether it's paganism at the age of Moses or in the time of Jesus and Paul. Let's take the time of Paul. You're a first century Jewish, Greco-Roman person. Now we'll scrap the Jewish heritage and just keep the Greco-Roman heritage. You might not even know too, too much about Jews. And you believe that there are thousands of gods. Modern Hindus believe there are millions. The ancient Greco-Romans believe that there were thousands. The trouble is you couldn't know them all, and they operated in different domains. So supposing you're invited to give a lecture in Rome, and you live in Caesarea Philippi. Well, it's going to be either a land voyage or a sea voyage. Let's say it's a sea voyage. A, a sea voyage, which means in order to be safe, you want the god of the sea, Neptune, on side. So you offer sacrifices to Neptune. Then when you get there, you, you, you want the god of communication on side so that you'll do a good job. So you offer sacrifices to Hermes in the Greek world, Mercury in the Latin world, and so on and so on and so on. And meanwhile, your wife is about to have a baby, so you want one of the fertility gods on side, and, and, and so it goes. You cannot possibly owe all your allegiance to any one of them. But supposing there's only one God, 
That's what the context of Deuteronomy 6 is all about. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. It only makes sense when there's one God. But then any other love that competes with that love becomes idolatry. That's the context of Deuteronomy 6. But the context of Deuteronomy 19, where the second great command is mentioned, is equally interesting. That chapter, Leviticus 19, has many individual commands, commands that have ethical flavors in many different directions, what you do with your crops, being honest with your, the people that you pay, having good relationships, and, and, and how you treat your parents, and so on. What's interesting in it, however, is that there is a refrain that keeps showing up, not in every verse, but in many, many verses. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and the refrain, I am the Lord. In other words, the grounding for this second great commandment is the first great commandment. The first great commandment is the greatest of all commandments because it's the one you always break when you break any other commandment. You are always sinning against the Lord God, always, always, if you're sinning against anyone else. And if you kept the first commandment perfectly, You wouldn't break any of the other commandments. But the second is the second because at very least it is taking you out of yourself. So much of our sin is bound up with self-focus, self-satisfaction, self-fulfillment. We look at the world through our own eyes. That part is natural. But our own eyes are so full of self-love that suddenly... To hear someone say, love your neighbor as yourself, seems either a mere formula or wildly implausible. And then it's justified in, I am the Lord. David understood that, you know. After he committed his horrible sin with uh, Bathsheba, and then arranged to have her husband bumped off, He thinks he's got away with it. He's eventually confronted by the prophet Nathan. And in due course, he writes in abject repentance, Psalm 51. When you go home tonight, read it. Not now, tonight. And amongst the things he says in Psalm 51 is, against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And you want to say to the man, David, give me a break. That's not quite true. I mean, you sinned against Bathsheba, you seduced her. You sinned against her husband, you had him killed. You sinned against the military high command, you corrupted them. You sinned against your own family, you betrayed them. You, you sinned against the nation b- b- because you're supposed to be the exemplar of justice. In fact, it's very difficult, my dear David, to think of somebody that you haven't sinned against. <laughs> and you say, against you only have I sinned? But you know, at the deepest level, David has it right. Because what makes the sin so sinful, what makes it so heinous, so utterly appalling, is that it is against God. If you cheat on your income tax, the person most offended is God Almighty, not Uncle Sam. You cheat on your spouse, the person most offended is God Almighty. You cheat on your exams, the person most offended is God Almighty. You puff yourself up with pride, the person most offended is God Almighty. Do you see? That is what falls out of, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And if we really did live that way, well, the second would flow. We wouldn't be self-absorbed. Of course we would love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, in Mark 12, when the lawyer asks this question, 
It's not in the context of saying, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's part of a theological discussion that was percolating around in, 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 in the first century in rabbinic circles. There was extensive discussion. And some of the rabbis actually gave answers very similar to what Jesus gives. So when Jesus gives his answer, well, the first one is love the Lord your God with heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. This questioner is not uppity. He's not trying to trick Jesus. He's, he's thinking it over and he says, yes, that really does make quite a lot of sense. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom. Not because I'm now going to go out and keep these laws perfectly and thus get into the kingdom, but precisely because you don't have a chance of getting into the kingdom unless you see in the first instance whom it is you've offended. And the story itself in Mark is taking us finally to the cross. Where, as we were singing a few moments ago, the cross where finally love and justice kiss. So that's the context. That's the context in Mark 12. What's the context here? Well, now this man is asking a different question, but giving the same answer. But because the question sets it up differently, the answer is different too. His question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if you quote these two texts, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, now it sounds as if obeying those two texts are precisely what will save you, which is not at all what was going on in the other passage. It may be that this man had heard Jesus' typical instruction along these lines, and he thought he'd throw these texts back, partly because this would prove that he already knew Jesus and, 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 and could throw these, these texts back in his face. Partly, it may have been in order to emphasize the law. The law, after all, was this lawyer's domain. So maybe he wanted to have some opportunity to say, the law is the most important thing. The law is what finally saves you. Obey the law and you will live. How must I inherit eternal life? What must I do? What do you think? And then he quotes Jesus' words at him, but spins it as if to say, do this and you will live, and don't you see, you must not say that there is any other way of salvation. The way of salvation is precisely bound up with the law. That's my domain, and I'm the expert. And Jesus says, well said, go ahead, do it, and you'll live. Now, if you don't have a funny bone, you'll hear these words and you'll think, oh, <laughs> did Jesus say that? Do this and you will live? You answered correctly? Ooh, I thought we were saved by grace. Hmm. I wonder why he's going to the cross a few chapters later. But if you have even a small funny bone, you'll hear these words and you'll grin from ear to ear. You know? The man pompously comes across and says, well, the way you get eternal life is uh, by loving God with heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. And that's my domain. And Jesus said, well done, go ahead, do it, and you'll live. <laughs> it's terrific. <laughs> Jesus is so good at this personal communication. He's so good at taking the mickey out of just the sorest spot in the entire argument. And the man knows he's been got at, which is what continues the conversation. The way you know that Jesus is actually saying this with his tongue firmly planted in his cheek is because that's the way the lawyer himself picks it up. He, know, he knows he's been beaten so far in this exchange where he was intending to embarrass Jesus. So he responds with a second dialogue in order to justify himself. Now, we need to pause and think about that. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Most in this room, I'm sure, are Christians. 
And if we're Christians who have been even minimally taught, then we know what justification is, especially in the Paulines, but even in the domain of systematic theology throughout Scripture. We know what justification is. Justification is that act by which God declares sinners to be just on the basis of the fact that Christ bore our sins in His own body on the tree so that my sin becomes His and He pays for it and His righteousness becomes mine. I am justified. So what's the opposite of justification? Well, I suppose you could say no justification. But you can be a wee bit more probing than that. The opposite of justification in which God justifies me because of what Christ does, the opposite of justification is self-justification. That's a huge theme in the Bible. It's actually quite an important theme in the Gospel of Luke. It's one of the minor sub-themes that runs through the whole book. For example, in Luke chapter 16, where Jesus is talking quite a lot about money, we read, verse 14, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What people highly value is detestable in God's sight. Now, in the context of talking about money, this means that what these characters were doing is justifying themselves, was justifying themselves on the basis of how much they had, how much they possessed. Now, probably they were sophisticated enough not to go around actually saying, I've got quite a lot in the bank, therefore I'm right with God. It's rare that people are quite that crass. And yet, and yet, if we do have more money, isn't it so easy in our relationships and in our friendships and in our dynamics just to look at things a little differently? Most of you are relatively poor students. <laughs> Some of you, I'm sure, can't afford a car. And some of you drive jalopies. <laughs> and then one day, you buy an old rebuilt Corvette. <laughs> and you're a Christian, of course. This has been a gift from God. I thank you, Lord, that I have this Corvette. <laughs> and you come up to the first stop sign, and you look over and there's somebody there in a rusted old jalopy. And you stick it in neutral, and you go, vroom, vroom. <laughs> then you drop it back in gear, and the light changes, and you burn rubber for about 35 feet, <laughs> and it feels good. Oh, make your own example up. It's just so easy to feel a wee bit superior because we have a little bit more, isn't it? It might not be quite as crass as that, but, but somehow it really does feel good. Your self-identity is bound up with how much you have. And some of the Pharisees were doing that and thus justifying themselves. But if you justify yourself, you can't be justified by God. But it's not just Luke 16. Look at Luke 18, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, verses 9 and following. To some who were confident of their own righteousness. Did you hear that? Confident of their own righteousness, justifying themselves. And look down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I do thank you, God, for your grace in my life. I do. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Listen to what Jesus says. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. The first man was self-justified. Only the second man was justified before God. And that brings us back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. This man, hearing this command to love your neighbor as yourself, <laughs> wanting to justify himself for having asked a question that put him in a corner, says, and, and who is my neighbor? There are so many ways in which we do not hear Scripture speak with all its power and escape its reach by picking up a little detail and arguing about it. Now, the details have to be understood. We spend a lot of time in seminary teaching exegesis. Yet, yet at the end of the day, don't try and escape the big picture of what is being said because you're arguing over a word here and there. Do you, do you, do you see? What should he have said? Jesus has said, well, fine, you'll be fine. You'll get into heaven. No problem. Just love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. No problem. What should he have been thinking? Oh, my, if those are the standards, I am in big trouble. To love God like that? All the time? And my neighbor as myself? I wonder it, what it would be like never ever to have told a lie. I wonder what it would be like never to have lusted after a person of the opposite sex. I, I wonder what it would be like never ever to have been puffed up in pride. I wonder what it would be like never ever to have uttered a put down that destroys people. I wonder what it would be like never ever to have cheated. I wonder. If that's the condition, am I in big trouble? That's only the second commandment. He hasn't got to the first yet. He doesn't even dare go there. But instead, he wants to exegete neighbor. And I tell you, we do all that kind of stuff every day of our lives, making excuses. But Jesus responds with his own question. And to ask his question, he sets it up with what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. So now let's run through the story itself. A man goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It really is mostly downhill, about 17 miles, much of it downhill, curvy, hilly, twisted. And he's set upon and robbed, beaten, stripped, utterly naked. After all, clothes were expensive in the ancient world, so you didn't just took, take a person's wallet. You took his clothes too. That, that, was, that was cash. First century society in Palestine was highly structured. Different groups could be identified by language, dress, accent. Priests, for example, could speak Hebrew. The peasants in the south could speak Aramaic. Along the coast, st some still spoke ancient Phoenician. Up in Galilee, they spoke Syriac and Greek. The government officials spoke Latin. And many of these characters wore slightly different clothing, too. But now this dude by the side of the road, he can't speak. He's half dead. In fact, he might even be dead. And he's stripped. So anybody passing by doesn't know anything about him. If the priest had known that it was a priest, he might have said, oh, that's one of my tribe. I've got to do something for him. If he had known that it was a Samaritan, he might have said, oh, boy, I'm not going to touch him. He deserves what he gets. But he's a nobody. He's a zero. There's nothing we know about him. He might be a foreigner anyway. And besides, if thugs have got him, they might still be in the hills around me. I'd better get out of here pretty quickly. A Levite does the same thing. And then along comes a Samaritan. <laughs> 
Now, everybody who's read their Bibles knows that the Samaritans and the Jews don't get along all that well, but it's important to remember every once in a while why they don't get along. There's a long history of bad blood. From reading your Old Testaments, you'll know that the nation of Israel was divided after Solomon's time into two parts. The northern ten tribes, that was then called Israel, and the southern two tribes, that was then called Judah. Because of endless sin, the northern tribes, the ten tribes, went off into captivity about uh, 721 B.C. And then, almost a century and a half later, the Jews from the south, the Judeans, they went off into captivity. The first group went off into captivity under the Assyrians, and the second group into captivity under the Babylonians. By going off into captivity, that doesn't mean these regional superpowers came in and transported everybody. They didn't do that. What they did was they transported the leadership, the tradespeople, the gifted business people, the aristocracy, the, the, the priests, uh, any government officials that they didn't kill, they transported them. Who knows what percentage of the population? 5, 10, 15 percent? Something like that. And then they would bring peoples that were captured in other territories back to this territory. And the result, of course, is that pretty soon you've got intermingled marriage. And with it, in this context, intermingled religion. And pretty soon the religion of the Samaritans, as they came to be called, because their chief province was Samaria, the religion of the Samaritans began to veer away from the religion of the Old Testament. In fact, they got to the place where they argued that only what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, were really the Word of God. They didn't like the rest of it because the rest of it got pretty quickly into a Davidic kingdom which was based in Jerusalem, and that's in the south. They didn't want anything to do with the south. In fact, what they did was build their own temple on the mountain slopes of Gedizim and Ebel. They had their own temple. But eventually, in the second century, after a lot of Jews have come back, and finally they've, they, they've managed to escape their own regional superpowers, the, 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 they, the Jews actually go north and bust up, destroy, level to the ground, the Samaritan temple. So these two groups hate each other. From the Jewish point of view, the Samaritans are half-breeds with a perverted Bible and a false center of religion. And from the point of view of the Samaritans, well, the Jews have an extended Bible that is not really a Bible. They're all focused on David instead of on God. And, and besides that, they're bullies who have come in and beaten us up and break, broken up our temple. So when the Gospel of John says the Jews and Samaritans have no dealings with one another, literally, they don't even eat together, you can understand how deep the antipathy is. But here's this Samaritan coming along, and he is the one who shows compassion. He doesn't ask, I wonder if this fellow is a Samaritan like me. He sees that he's alive and puts him on his own donkey, pours in oil and wine, a common medicinal mix at the time, and takes him off to the closest hotel. Well, it's not the Holiday Inn. It's a roadside way where you're probably sleeping on straw with the animals. But he looks after him, and he pays the hotel owner, enough money to cover a couple of weeks, and then says, listen, anything more than that, I'll cover the bill. You know me, I come back this way pretty often, whatever it is he runs up, I'll cover it. Now that's not just generous, it's spectacularly important, because in the ancient world, you see, there were no bankruptcy laws. If you owed money and couldn't pay, you had to sell yourself into slavery. Supposing the Samaritan had brought the fellow there, dropped him off, and then went off on his business, and the guy can't start walking around and doing anything and do any work for four weeks. He's just run up a tab of four weeks. And if he can't pay it, and of course he can't pay it, he doesn't have a wallet, he doesn't have clothes, he's, he's got nothing, he's stripped. Then he goes into slavery. He sells himself self into slavery. By the Samaritan's generosity, the Samaritan has not only saved this man from death, he saved him from slavery too. Then Jesus smiles, and he says, uh, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Do you hear the subtlety of Jesus' question? The lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? Jesus asks, who is the neighbor to somebody else? 
The lawyer is asking, who is my neighbor? Because he wants to know what he doesn't have to do. He wants to know how little he can get away with. But Jesus reverses the order and says, which one was the neighbor to somebody else? That's the question you should be asking. And the man, for his part, can't even bring himself to say the word, the Samaritan. He says, rather, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So that's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now I want you to enlarge your horizon just a wee bit and notice some of the themes right around this passage. In chapter 9, start at verse 44. In verse 43, all kinds of people are marveling at what Jesus did, His miracles, His teaching, and all the rest. But Jesus says to His disciples, listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. He's announcing His death, His brutal death by crucifixion. But they did not understand what, was, what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask Him about it. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus makes a prediction like this five times, and the disciples still don't get it. It's not because they're stupid. It's because their entire set of categories about what a Messiah was like didn't allow for them to think of a crucified Messiah. Messiahs win, especially Messiahs that can do miracles like this. What are you going to do to, to kill Jesus if he can calm the sea and, and, and raise the dead and, and heal the sick with, with power like that? What Roman army is going to take him on? I'll bet half the disciples were saying to themselves, man, I'd love to watch it when they tried. And Jesus instead is announcing his, his, his impending death. They didn't have a category for a crucified Messiah. So they're saying Jesus must be talking about something symbolic here. It's deep, brother. It's deep, deep. But they don't want to show up their ignorance and ask anything. So they, they just don't know. They don't understand. That's right through all four Gospels. And the discussion continues until you get all the way to verse 51. And Luke says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, that is, up to heaven through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, as that time approached, the time for the passion and resurrection narratives, as that time approached, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus is not a martyr caught up in the vicious tides of history. He goes to Jerusalem knowing full well this is what awaits him. And this begins what many people have called Luke's travel narrative. That is, Luke sets the scene so that from here on, Jesus as it were, is heading toward Jerusalem. Now, topically, Luke can bring in material from elsewhere and so on after this, but, but in terms of the flow of the narrative, Jesus is heading for Jerusalem and the cross, which is Luke's way of saying everything that Jesus says and does from this point on is under the shadow of the cross. And if you don't see that, you don't understand Luke's gospel. Luke has put the book together topically very carefully. Then look at the beginning of chapter 10, the passage just before the, pas the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus sends out the 72. It's kind of training mission, anticipating further evangelism and the like. He gives them power to do miracles, and he tells them how to preach and what to say and in whose home to, 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 to stay in. And he warns what happens to the cities in Galilee where people do not accept the Word of God. But eventually, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, it's wonderful. Even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. 
At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. Do you hear this? This has to be integrated with what comes next, the parable of the Good Samaritan. This in a context where the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing, destroying the power of the demonic. The word is being preached. The culture is being divided. Are you for Jesus or against him? And the people who are getting it are not the bright intellects. They're those who approach Jesus like little children. And this is God's good design in his own sovereign decree. That's the way God ordained it. And Jesus says, yes, Father, this is right. This is good. It pleased you. It's wonderful. Did you see? That's the framework of Jesus on the way to the cross. Does the name Martin Lloyd-Jones mean anything to you? If you're above a certain age, you know who he is. If you're below a certain age, you may not. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a Welshman who preached for many years in London, England, and in the middle of the 20th century was probably the most gifted preacher in the English-speaking world. There have been 73 volumes of his published sermons in print. He preached regularly to thousands and thousands. He was instrumental in the rejuvenation of uh, InterVarsity after World War II. He was instrumental also in the establishment of a research organization called Tyndale House, a, a research library for evangelicals in Cambridge. He was instrumental in the Puritan Conference in Britain and in the Westminster Conference for Ministers. He was instrumental in the establishment of the Banner of Truth Trust. He came to this country and preached everywhere he went. His power was, was enormous. And then he got cancer. And about six months before he died, his biographer, Ian Murray, who had ready access to him all the time, asked him one day, do you mind if I raise a personal question with you? Now, I didn't know the doctor well, but I knew him pretty well. And that's not the sort of thing you would say to him. He had a huge sense of humor, but he was not sort of warm and fuzzy. He was a deeply principled man. But Murray had been an assistant minister with him and wanted to ask him what he thought was a really important question. The question he asked, in effect, was this. How are you coping now that you've been put on the shelf? It takes all of your energy to get out of bed, put on your three-piece suit. He did that every time he got up. Put on his three-piece suit, tie, vest. Sit in a chair and edit a manuscript for an hour or so before his energy ran out and he got undressed and went back into bed. It takes all your energy to do that. You're no longer preaching to thousands, tens of thousands. Basically, you've been put on the shelf. How are you coping with that? And Lloyd-Jones said, Do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you in my name, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. I am perfectly content. Do you hear that? We justify ourselves even on the basis of our work. There are ministers who justify themselves because of the size of their churches. There are theologians who justify themselves because of the quality of their students or the number of books they've written. There are undergraduates who justify themselves because they did an A, a 4.0, because they got into the decent grad school. Or because they're real hunks and are just ripping up the turf. <laughs> we spend so much time justifying ourselves. But this man on the edge of death, looking back over his whole life, he says at the end of the day, what Jesus tells us is, don't rejoice over these things, even when God enables you to cast out demons. 
or preach powerfully and see the kingdom coming. Did you know? It's not really all that important compared with whether or not you know God and God knows you. Whether or not your name is written in. Now that's important. What's really important is God justifying you. Not whether you justify yourself. So do you hear what's happening? Jesus is on the way to the cross where he dies for sinners. And under that shadow of his move to Jerusalem, you hear Jesus saying, watch out for what's important. What's important is whether or not you know me. Your self-justification must not even be bound up with ministry. You claim to be doing the kingdom work, but if that's where your self-justification is, it's nothing. And now you find a man who's arguing theologically and wants to justify himself even over his theological opinions. And over against all of that stands the cross. And if we still haven't got it from the context, what happens immediately after the parable of the Good Samaritan? What's the story that comes next? You find Jesus at the home of Martha and Mary. And one sister is doing a lot of necessary work. That's not the problem. But she's resentful because she's doing it by herself. And the other is sitting at Jesus' feet. And which one is justified by Jesus? As he's on his way to the cross. So now, let me wrap up, first of all, with three pastoral applications for all of us. And then three, very quickly, for the broader culture. Number one, in the light of the flow of the entire book of Luke, in fact, of all four Gospels, in fact, of the entire New Testament, in fact, of all of Scripture, eternal life, finally, is secured by God's gracious provision of a Redeemer. It is inherited as a gift. It cannot be earned. The pretentiousness of this lawyer is appalling. It is deeply disturbing. He really thinks that he can achieve what God demands, loving God with heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. He really thinks that he can achieve that all by himself. Do not be so foolish. Number two, There is a sense, I almost hesitate to say this, there is a sense, but it's not quite what Jesus means when he tells the story, but there is a sense in which Jesus is the Good Samaritan. I don't pretend that that's what Jesus means when he tells the story. I do claim that's part of what Luke is saying. Because the whole gospel of Luke is about someone who comes in from the outside and who is rejected like the Samaritan, who saves us from sickness and death and provides everything so that we even escape slavery. And he doesn't do it just for his friends. He does it for the people who are on the opposite side of every cultural divide you can think of. Now, that's not why Jesus tells a story. That, that would be reading in much too much. Jesus tells some stories in order to make himself out to be the figure in the parable. He doesn't tell this story this way, but Luke sees it. All the surrounding flow of the threads Luke is building shows that Luke has, show that Luke has thought about this, and there is a sense in which Jesus himself is the greatest good Samaritan who ever lived. Number three. Yet clearly Jesus expects his followers to behave as he himself does. He does finish up by saying to the expert in the law, go and do likewise. For the truth of the matter is, though we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, if it's real grace and real faith, they're never alone. 
The ground of our salvation is the grace of God and the cross. The means by which that salvation is received is by faith. But where it's real grace and real faith, there's real change. The cross in the Scriptures is sometimes diminished by folk on the far left to being a sort of sentimental piece. Just act like Jesus did and you'll be all right. And we say, no, no, look at all of these passages that, that, that say he was wounded for our transgressions. Our sin was put upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. And, and, and he hung on the cross and bore our sins in his own body on the tree, Peter says. And he turns aside the wrath of God, Romans says. You must emphasize all of those things. All true, all true. But the Apostle Peter also says, he does this leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And that's why Jesus himself can teach, if anyone wants to come after me and follow me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Not because our cross is exactly what Jesus' cross is, but as Jesus' cross meant death to self, death to himself as he pursues his Father's will, which uniquely brings about our redemption, following Jesus as he goes to Jerusalem to the cross. It means we must die to ourselves as part of this commitment to follow Jesus. There is no genuinely saved person who has not taken up his cross. None. Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple unless you take up your cross. Can't be. And that's why, however faultingly, however hesitatingly, however inconsistently, nevertheless, all genuine Christians will hunger from the deepest level of their beings to take up their crosses and follow Jesus as Jesus went to the cross too. The only alternative to that is self-focus again, self-interest. Me at the center of the universe. We're back with a lawyer again, making excuses. Who's my neighbor? But let me end with a few further reflections on the parable of the sower. We live in a generation today in which many, many, many young people I'm old enough that I can say that. I know. Many, many, many young people are saying something like this. You know, in the past uh, 75 years or so, 100 years, the conservatives emphasized saving grace and right doctrine and belief, but they weren't really too good on digging wells in the Sahel and building hospitals and social justice. And, and the left side, for its part, it was really bad on doctrine. They sacrificed so much. But boy, at least they had a social conscience. But we're going to be the generation that puts it all together. We'll maintain the doctrine. And we will transform the culture. Now, I'm from Chicago, and before that I'm from Canada, and I lived for a long time in England. But is that sentiment found here as well, in Raleigh, Durham? Am, am, I, am, am I barking up the wrong... I don't think so. I think this is pretty widely distributed, a, a pretty widely distributed opinion in, in North America today. And you know what? An awful lot of it is very good. It's very good. Mind you, there are a couple of little niggly worries I have about it. The first is, I'm always a wee bit worried when somebody says, everybody has had it wrong before me in the church, and now that I'm here, we've got it right. <laughs> I, I always have a few red flags on that one, do, 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 do you know? I was speaking recently to one of our guys at Trinity who teaches um, mission and contextual theology, Jim Pluteman. For many years, he was a missionary in Africa. Before that, he was international director of SIM, one of the great faith missions, and then has taught mission theology for quite some years. So he's been around. 
And he, when he hears this, you know what he says? He says, SIM has been in Africa now for almost 150 years. And during that time, they planted churches and evangelized and established whole denominations in different countries. But you know what? Almost every great hospital in Africa, south of the Sahel, has been built by SIM and is still largely staffed by them. And nobody told us that we had to do it for reasons of social justice. It was just because we're Christians. One of the books I'm reading at the moment, I recommend it to you. You can download it on Kindle or buy it on Amazon.com. It's not too expensive. Written by a Chinese man who's not a Christian. The book is called God is Red. It's a wonderful book. What it does is trace this man's discovery of what Christians did in the 1800s, 1900s, uh, 19th century, 20th century in China before the communists took over. And it's not that he believes them. It's not that he's become a Christian. I mean, he's talked with so many of them, lived with them, watched with them, seen their tombs in the far western side of China, talked to the descendants of people who were converted under their ministries. And what he is just blown away by is the sacrifice of these missionaries who came and provided quinine and fought disease and helped the people and loved them and taught them to read and provided food, cared for them, as well as planted churches and preaching the gospel. They didn't have to wait till 2012 to figure out that you put some of those things together. Be careful not to malign forefathers who had it put together before us. The second largely cultural thing I want to say is there are both good and bad historical precedents for getting this sort of thing right. You see, it does remain the case that when a whole lot of Christians start talking about doing good and loving your neighbor and helping people along the, tri the trail to Jericho, in some cases, it so eclipses the gospel that preaching the gospel is diminished. But there are also historical examples where People have got it right. So that from about 1880 on in this country, we got a lot of it wrong. Really wrong. And there were an awful lot of people that so focused on preaching the gospel by your deeds that pretty soon there was no gospel to preach. A lot of people quote words that allegedly come from St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. That's ridiculous, partly because St. Francis of Assisi never read it, never said it. But, but partly, it's, it's silly because what the gospel is is news. It's good news about Jesus. In the first instance, what you do with news is announce it. That's what you do with news. You don't tell a newscaster at 11 o'clock, tonight, announce the news. If necessary, use words. What you do with news is announce it. That's why there is so much emphasis in the Bible on announcing it, bearing witness to it, preaching it. The good news at its heart is the good news of what God has done in Christ Jesus to save a rotten, rebellious race with all of its entailments both for this life and the life to come. That has to be announced. That's the gospel. That's the good news. But the good news so transforms us that we start doing good things too. So at the time of Whitfield and Wesley, in the 1740s in Britain, slavery was on the rise in the empire. On Easter Sunday in London in 1740, only six people showed up for Holy Communion on Easter Sunday. The rich were getting richer. The poor were getting poor. Children at the age of five were down on the mines, killing themselves with a the coal dust. The Brits were heading for a revolution every bit as wild as the French Revolution. God raised up Howell Harris in Wales. And George Whitfield in England started preaching to the coal miners at 5 o'clock in the morning in Bristol. And then John and Charles Wesley. And over 60 years, 
The gospel was proclaimed until the Lord also raised up the Countess of Huntingdon and Wilberforce and Shaftesbury, and they tackled slavery, they tackled injustice, they tackled the reform of the prisons. Do you see? At the same time that these people were still themselves preaching the gospel, having their devotions in the morning, leading their children to faith. Do you you see? It was a full-orbed thing. Don't sacrifice that wholeness. Don't sacrifice that wholeness. Do you want me to tell you what the test is? Some of you will know that I, I am president of something called the Gospel Coalition. And two or three years ago when we were arguing amongst ourselves at our council, how do, how do, how do we get this right? Preserving what the gospel is but still being concerned for people? How, 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 do you, how do you get this right so that we follow the good examples of, of, of the great evangelical awakening and not the bad examples of, of, of liberal Protestantism? How, how, how do you do that? And one of our members sat at the end of the table. He's known for his blunt speech. And he didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. We all gave our profound suggestions. And then he simply said, preach hell. (laughs) I was in the chair. I said, uh, uh, what what did you say? Preach hell. I said, would you like to unpack that just a wee bit? He said, unless you're preaching hell, you don't really believe in alleviating suffering. Because Christians are interested in alleviating suffering both temporal and eternal. And if you only are interested in alleviating temporal suffering, you don't really love people. Preach hell. And besides, he says, if you do preach hell while you're drinking wells in the Sahel, the liberal organizations won't want to have anything to do with you, and that'll help you too. (laughs) Last. Last. Still a broader reflection on what I've just said. I've been teaching now for pretty close to 40 years, and I've learned something strange. My students don't learn most of what I teach them. It's taken me a long time to learn that, but I've learned it well. They don't learn most of what I teach them. Do you know what they learn? They learn what I'm excited about. So if you are going to preserve the gospel, the flow of the narrative to the cross, Jesus heading for Jerusalem, how men and women are saved, with all that results in transformed living, Feed your soul such that you will always be excited with the gospel so that you get out of the bed in the morning because of the gospel, because you want to see people converted under the gospel. You're heading with Jesus on the way to the cross. If you get to the place where the gospel is that which is assumed, while what you're really excited about is fighting malaria, which still needs to be done. Don't misunderstand me. But if what gets you out of bed in the morning is no longer the gospel but fighting malaria, pretty soon you assume the gospel. And your students and your friends will be excited about what you're excited about. And within a generation and a half, they deny that which you still confess but which you're no longer excited about. You need to fan into flame in your soul, in your mind, every day of your existence, the supreme importance of alleviating suffering, both temporal and eternal, by the gospel. God have mercy on us. And then within that framework, on the way to the cross, on the way to Jerusalem, hear the word of the Lord. Go and do likewise. Let us pray.